Cassie Coolidge nodded automatically and expressed gratitude to those who came to see her husband Kevin off. Due to the tears in her eyes, even the faces of familiar people appeared as blurred spots. The blurring of images was irritating, creating a strong desire to escape from sympathetic words and pitying looks, to find a hiding place and try to comprehend what had happened. Kevin was known for his good health and healthy lifestyle. Cassie never knew him to smoke, and he drank in moderation, preferring quality to quantity. He would occasionally work out at a fitness club, but overall he lived a normal life. However, an unfortunate combination of circumstances shattered the well-being of the Coolidge family. Kevin exceeded the speed limit slightly on a wet highway after rain, which worsened the consequences of the violation and led to a car crash. The car was not found immediately in the ditch. Later, someone whispered the opinion that if Kevin had been brought to the hospital earlier, his chances of survival would have been higher. According to experts, the car was irreparable, but the strong body of the 33-year-old man miraculously clung to life, surprising the doctors. Cassie, who was not allowed into the intensive care unit, prayed desperately, begging not to take her husband. Unfortunately, the miracle did not happen. Kevin fought for two days against the scythe-wielding old woman, but ultimately lost. By an inexplicable coincidence, Cassie was approaching the hospital at that moment to inquire about her husband's condition in person. She tripped on a flat surface and scraped her knee. The searing pain was quickly forgotten when she received the tragic news of her husband's death. Although Cassie saw Kevin's lifeless body and selected things for his burial, she could not believe the sad event was real. As the first clods of earth fell on the shiny black coffin, Cassie wanted to squeeze her eyes shut and then open them and realise that the funeral of her beloved husband was just a nightmare or a reflection of her hidden fear of losing him. However, everything was real. The rapidly growing mound of clay earth, the plaque that depicted Kevin's entire life between two dates, and the memorial dinner filled with the buzz of many voices. People were saying things, but for the young widow, it all merged into an incomprehensible and irritating cacophony. Once her rock-solid support, her beloved husband was gone, Cassie experienced a strange mix of emotions. Overwhelming grief flooded her heart, accompanied by a burning resentment towards the cruel and unjust fate that had taken away her main source of support in life. Through the thick layer of absorbent cotton, Cassie heard fragments of phrases describing Kevin as a good, reliable and responsible man. However, these kind words only caused her pain. She felt anger towards her husband, blaming him for the accident due to his own self-confidence. Cassie felt incredibly ashamed of this illogical feeling, but she didn't know how to continue living without her beloved husband. Their family, life, had been so harmonious that Cassie never regretted marrying Kevin and had hoped for a long life together. During their seven years of happy marriage, Cassie and her husband had purchased a well-appointed one-story house in a suburb. They had even started considering expanding their family. Once, a few days before the wedding, they had a frank talk and decided to postpone becoming parents until Cassie was ready. She was well aware of the challenges that come with having children. Shortly after Cassie's 11th birthday, her mother and stepfather had a son named Tom, followed by a daughter named Grace a year later. Despite the added responsibilities, Cassie willingly took on the role of caring for her younger siblings. She felt sorry for her mother, who was sleep-deprived and transformed from a vibrant woman into a tired figure with sunken eyes and protruding collarbones. Cassie took on household chores, such as washing clothes, hanging and ironing bedding and baby clothes, fetching baby food, soothing them, going on walks with them. And all this was to give her mum some time to rest, shower or eat in peace. Cassie's biological father paid a small amount of child support, while her stepfather Peter provided for the needs of the growing family. Despite their limited financial resources, Cassie didn't complain because she didn't feel like an unwanted stepchild. 
Peter treated her well and never differentiated between her and his own children when it came to gifts. After recovering from Grace's birth, Cassie's mother regained her previous personality. She tried to distribute her love equally among all her children and was incredibly grateful to her eldest daughter for her support and patience. However, it was actually Cassie who had the most difficult time during that period. She managed to study and maintain good grades, while also showing kindness to Tom and Grace. But having experienced the challenges of motherhood from a young age, adult Cassie didn't feel ready to have a child with her beloved husband, Kevin. They both wanted to ensure the best conditions for their future baby. For now, as they were ready for having kids, it happened impossible. Their happiness, dreams, long-term plans, and even the upcoming weekend were all abruptly cut short. After the funeral, Cassie, accompanied by her mother, returned to their empty house and broke down in tears in the shower, without caring about the cold water. After that, the chilled Cassie, without even drying her hair, collapsed on the bed. Her caring mother covered her with a blanket and gently stroked her back, in an attempt to comfort her. Warmed and exhausted, Cassie fell into a deep sleep, hardly moving and without any dreams until morning. The new day held no joy for her. Cassie went about her day mechanically, her mind filled with thoughts of Kevin and what she should say or do at this moment. For the first days, her mother, who had taken two weeks off from work, stayed with her. She accompanied Cassie to and from work, practically forced her to eat breakfast and dinner, and in the evenings they worked together in a small vegetable garden. These monotonous activities couldn't fully calm Cassie, but they provided a small distraction from her gloomy thoughts. Summer, indifferent to human sorrow, filled the air with the scent of blooming flowers, while Trudy anxiously observed her daughter, who had almost stopped smiling. Peter, Tom and Grace visited them several times, but the family gatherings only irritated Cassie instead of bringing solace. She understood that her relatives meant well, but the effort to suppress her grief drained her of energy. She didn't want to see anyone at all. She barely participated in conversations, and any discussion about Kevin caused her physical pain that was almost tangible. After two weeks, Cassie said, Mum, thank you for everything, but perhaps you should go home. Tom, Grace and Peter need you, and it's time for you to go to work and it's not very convenient to get here. Trudy tried to object, but Cassie began to persuade her, saying, Don't worry, I'll manage on my own. I'll be smart, and won't forget to eat properly in the morning and evening. Our almost grown-up little ones, and Peter, must have missed you. I feel bad taking you away from your family for so long. It'll be all right. Trudy, looking into her daughter's eyes, decided to believe her, because Tom, who was experiencing his first crush and Grace, who had broken her arm while riding a bicycle, needed her attention now. Closing the door behind her mother, Cassie was left alone in the house, which was destined to be a happy family nest, only for such a short time. The woman's desperate grief was replaced by deafening apathy and indifference to everything and everyone. She still performed her duties at her once favourite job without the usual enthusiasm, communicated with relatives on the phone. Cassie's mum, stepfather, brother and sister offered her multiple times to move in with them, even for a short period. However, she flatly refused the idea. The grieving woman felt that she had no right to leave the house, which she and her husband had passionately and lovingly brought to an ideal image. Gradually, Cassie's mood started to change. It became increasingly difficult for her to be alone in the house, with her gloomy thoughts, but she didn't want to bother her family. Her brother and sister were busy with their own teenage affairs. Her mother had already helped to survive through this tragic period. Cassie didn't dare to ask her mother-in-law, Selma, for a favour, as she would burst into tears, barely crossing the threshold of her son's house. So, Cassie experienced loneliness to the fullest. Of course, long telephone conversations with relatives and friends partly helped, but the feeling of bitterness didn't leave Cassie. She realised that the common phrase that time heals is just a pseudo-comforting deception. 
The acute sense of irreplaceable loss may have dulled, but it hasn't disappeared completely. Slowly, but Cassie started to get rid of her indifference to the world around her and began to immerse herself in work, paying special attention to the details. Coming up to her home, she no longer looked at its windows with desperate hope, dreaming that there would be light and her husband waiting for her inside their lovingly arranged home. Sometimes Cassie deeply regretted postponing having a child. A child would have been her salvation and the meaning of life. However, she tried not to dwell too deeply on these worries, because she knew they were completely useless. She couldn't change anything. She had to learn to live again without her husband. Household chores demanded constant attention, and one day Cassie finally had the courage and strength to go up to the attic where her husband had set up a study and pursued his favourite hobby. He glued models of ships, and Cassie respected his space and didn't disturb the peace of her beloved man. Besides, he preferred to clean the attic himself, as he feared she might accidentally throw away something important. Overall, Cassie was content with this arrangement. She realised that even with great mutual love, spouses could have their own hobbies. If Kevin found inner harmony in the attic, why not? The woman always knew that he was close by and would rush to her aid at the first request. However, Cassie always gave her husband the opportunity to enjoy his hobby in peace and quiet and did not often venture into the attic. And now she entered the territory where Kevin had recently reigned supreme. It felt as if by going through the things that had been touched by her husband's hands, she was saying hello to him. Besides, all the utility bills needed to be taken care of. While she had a rough idea of how and where to do it, with the blocked auto payments from Kevin's card, she needed to find out if any debts had accumulated, and if so, eliminate them. With a mixture of trepidation and determination, the woman crossed the threshold of the attic. Her eyes filled with tears, and her throat felt a bitter lump, making it hard to breathe fully. Cassie squeezed her eyes shut, took a moment to compose herself, then opened her eyes and braved the room she had once jokingly called her husband's lair. It gave her the creeps, but she resolutely began sorting through the contents of the desk drawers, searching for the necessary documents. As she sorted through the papers, Cassie discovered a plastic folder with several transparent files. One of them contained a contract with a private boarding house, for the disabled called Mercy. On the lines designated for the customer's information, Kevin's name and surname were written in his unmistakable handwriting. Cassie had no doubt that Kevin had entered this information himself. According to the document, her late husband had been paying for the care of a certain Kristen Richards in a rather expensive place. Cassie couldn't recall any acquaintances with such a person, and as far as she knew, Kevin didn't have any relatives with that name either. The date of the contract and the carefully enclosed receipts in another file indicated that her late husband had started paying for the stay of this unknown woman in the boarding house even before they got married, and he continued to do so throughout their married life, even when their budget was already strained due to large-scale purchases and the renovation of the house and property. They didn't reach the point of poverty but they still tried to save money. Although Cassie knew it was partly foolish, an irrational jealousy suddenly pierced her heart. How could this be? While she denied herself pleasures like visiting a beautician or going on trips, Kevin was annually spending significant sums on the stay of the woman in an institution with a kind name, but absolutely not merciful prices. But what outraged Cassie the most was not just the money that was irrevocably being paid to that place, but the fact that all of this was done secretly, without any coordination or even a simple conversation with her. Couldn't Kevin have confessed, say, something like, My dear wife, I have to help someone in a difficult situation. Yes, Cassie would probably have asked about the reasons behind this untimely and unfashionable altruism, but she certainly wouldn't have forbidden it. Kevin couldn't have been unaware of that. However, he never mentioned his act of charity, not even in passing. 
Cassie had a burning desire to reveal this secret, especially since the due date for the next payment was approaching in about a month. She needed to find out what to do with this unexpected contract. Setting aside the folder with its mysterious contents, the widow continued sorting through her husband's papers, but her thoughts kept returning to the secret she had uncovered. Why did Kevin keep his help to this woman from her? What was the reason for such secrecy from the man whom Cassie considered incredibly honest? Suspecting that her late husband's mother might know something about the mysterious boarding place, Cassie decided to visit her on the next day off. Who else but Selma would be aware of it? Although their relationship was built on the principle that a bad peace is better than a good quarrel, the loss of the man they both loved inexplicably resolved most of their disagreements. So, two days later, Cassie was sitting in Kevin's mother's living room. Initially, it was Selma who did all the talking. She complained to her daughter-in-law that after her son's premature death, her health had deteriorated. With frequent bouts of malaise, heart pain and high blood pressure, Selma shared her sad thoughts, expressing that her life had lost all meaning. If you and Kevin had a child, I wouldn't be so lonely. Why must I continue living? You're still young. You'll get married and you shouldn't still grieve for Kevin. You can have as many children as you want with your new husband, but I'll die all alone, without loved ones, and there won't be anyone left after me. Cassie bit her lip to hold back tears. Memories of her husband and her mother-in-law's assumption that she would still find love again pierced her heart. After patiently waiting for the mother-in-law to express everything that had been weighing on her, Cassie decided to get straight to the point, realising that there was no use in beating around the bush. Selma, who was Kristen Richards to your son? A tense silence filled the room. Cassie closely observed her mother-in-law and noticed her facial twitch, realising that the names mentioned were at least familiar to Selma. However, the grey-haired woman with a stylish haircut did not rush to say anything, even the opposite. In an attempt to conceal the uncharacteristic discomfort for her, she began meticulously cutting the food brought by her daughter-in-law, even though the table was already laid out. Only when there was barely any space left on the round table, free from plates of various sizes, did the mother-in-law finally take a seat, gesturing for Cassie to sit down as well, and confessed. To be honest, I had hoped to never hear about Kristen Richards again, let alone talk about her. I prefer not to dwell on her or anything related to her, but if you're asking about her, it must be for a serious reason, and I can't remain silent, can I? Selma asked Cassie an almost rhetorical question, setting aside her cup of tea and looking at her daughter-in-law directly in the eyes. Cassie nodded, hesitating to admit that she had discovered a contract for the maintenance of this Miss Richards among her husband's papers. The mother-in-law, clearly satisfied with her daughter-in-law's silent gesture, continued her story. In general, Kristen is Kevin's first serious love. He probably wouldn't mind if you learned about this story for your own comfort. Although, honestly, I must confess that my involvement in my son's romantic passion played a negative role. I didn't like Kristen at first sight when I first met her. She had a silly smile as if apologising, and wore cheap clothes with ridiculous lipstick. Her hair was discoloured and yellowish, and she had these unreal, sad, big eyes like a cow. But her appearance and makeup skills were the least of my concerns. Youth and proper use of cosmetics can make anyone look beautiful. And I must admit that Kristen's facial features were quite attractive and somewhat endearing. But as a person, she wasn't a suitable match for my son. I thought this then, and my opinion hasn't changed. This girl didn't even complete high school, and then she took a short-term sales course at some centre. A profession, of course, is necessary, but she showed no desire for self-improvement. She was content with her narrow-mindedness like a snail. She admitted in our conversation that she found books boring. Kevin saw Kristen in a store when he went to the countryside with his friends. They were going to someone's summer house and decided to buy soda on the way because it was hot. They stopped at a supermarket where Kristen worked. My Kevin fell in love with her. I don't know why. Her family, to put it mildly, were peculiar and quite dysfunctional. She never knew her father, and her mother had almost lost parental rights to her and her three siblings, including Kristen. 
who was 10 years old at the time. By some miracle, this mother convinced the guardianship authorities that she would change her lifestyle. But things only got worse. Kristen told me that sometimes she had been hungry for several days. To my horror, Kevin seemed to ignore the issue of bad heredity. Even the fact that Kristen had a child born out of wedlock did not bother him. She proudly boasted that she had given birth to her daughter Stacy at the age of 16, claiming that her decision to keep the child was the best one she had ever made. According to her, having her daughter was a reminder that someone in the world truly needed her, without any doubts. When I asked about the child's father, Kristen dismissed the question, stating that it was a youthful romantic fling, and she remembered nothing about it. She even believed that she had more advantages being a single mother. I was almost in disbelief as I listened to her story during our first encounter. How could my intelligent, educated, knowledgeable son not realise that this simple-minded single mother was not a suitable match for him? I don't have a problem with social differences. I'm not a snob. It's not Kristen's fault that she was born into a bad family. Her mother's lifestyle, who gave birth to children for personal gain or due to a lack of judgment, was also not her responsibility. However, it was clear for me that growing up in such an environment would not provide a positive influence or upbringing. It wasn't just the questionable heredity that concerned me when I thought about my son's future with this woman. It was Kristen's unhealthy confidence that bothered me the most. Her arrogance as a young, impudent and audacious woman threw me off balance. Moreover, she dared to respond to me in a harsh manner, without considering her choice of words and without fear of appearing rude. When I inquired about their living conditions, Kristen laughed. She jokingly mentioned that her mother's house resembled a barn and was almost uninhabitable. Kristen openly mocked me, stating that Kevin had promised to rent an apartment because, in her words, she didn't want to share a kitchen with her mother-in-law. It's hard to imagine, but Kevin didn't react to this attack against me. When I learned more about Kristen's life, I felt overwhelmed with stress. After all the sleepless nights, I spent taking care of Kevin when he was sick, helping him with his studies and supporting his career advancement. I couldn't bear the thought of him burdening himself with an uneducated, rude woman and her child for another relationship. Of course, one could argue that Kristen is not to blame for her circumstances, and if she had had a different personality, she might not have survived up in such a situation. But that did little to console me. Selma fell silent. It was obviously difficult for her to recall the past, and Cassie did not want to rush the woman who was deep in thought while staring at a sandwich, contemplating whether or not to take a bite. Soon, Selma continued. Kevin and Kristen's romance had been developing. They even visited me with little Stacy, but my opinion about this mismatched union did not change. The girl, of course, was not at fault for her mother's attachment to my son, but I couldn't bring myself to show her any affection or offer words of encouragement. During their visit, I listened to Kevin, Kristen, and even little Stacy discussing the details of their upcoming wedding, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of dread that my son would be in slavery. He would have to tear his veins supporting to the big family. Unfortunately, if I were to explicitly voice my objections, it might result in severing my bond with my son. I was terrified. However, the wedding was not meant to be. It was such a tragedy that even I, despite my dislike for Kristen, felt sorry for her. On that day, she went to her dysfunctional neighbourhood to pack her belongings, take her daughter, and return here forever. Kevin couldn't accompany her as he had to go on a business trip for work. He asked Kristen to wait for his return, but she was eager to leave behind the miserable existence she had known. For her, the move to the apartment rented by my son was a grand event, and the upcoming marriage was like winning the lottery, an unexpected stroke of luck. What else could it be? A simple girl with no education, but with a child, and a man like Kevin was attracted to her. In general, an official marriage for a young single mother from a dysfunctional family 
is practically a modern version of a Cinderella fairy tale. I believed that she had attached herself to my son solely because he could provide her with a path to a normal life. Later, Kevin blamed himself for not convincing Kristen to wait at her home a little longer. They should have gone together to collect her meagre belongings and her daughter, and the tragedy could have likely been avoided. But it happened as it happened. A terrible misfortune occurred. The kind that even the most bitter enemy wouldn't wish upon anyone. Kristen's mother, if she could even be called that word, threw a party before parting ways with her daughter and granddaughter. In reality, as I came to realise later, any excuse was used as an opportunity to drink. As the investigation later revealed, one of the invited guests fell asleep with an unlit cigarette. The house was in disrepair, a wooden shack nestled on the outskirts of the residential area. The worst part was that the intoxicated individuals who fell asleep on the veranda survived. However, Kristen, her sisters and her daughter were trapped. Not everyone was able to survive amidst the chaos, and the victims of the fire were Stacy and one of her aunts. Kristen herself, in her attempt to save her daughter and sisters, suffered burns, injuries, and lost her ability to walk, along with an unimaginable grieve. It was truly horrifying. The surviving sisters worsened the nightmarish situation. They all blamed Kristen in unison, claiming that it was her fault the party was organised and the house burned down. They even came to our apartment to demand compensation for the fire from Kevin. Can you imagine such rotten individuals? Their niece had died, their sister was in the hospital, yet they had no shame in extorting money from her fiancé. I drove them away, but I was relieved that fate had spared me from such relatives. As I share this with you now, I can't help but shudder because of my thoughts at that time. The grief was unimaginable, but there was a glimmer of joy in my heart. Kevin acted like a true gentleman and disregarded all of my attempts to dissuade him. He visited Kristen in the hospital and was determined to still marry his beloved, despite her disfigurement. But she rejected him. I pleaded with Kristen, kneeling before her, begging her not to ruin my son's future and to refuse to marry him. Somehow, I found the words to convince her not to destroy his life. The wedding was cancelled, and with time, my son managed to find peace. It was undoubtedly sinful, but I was relieved that Kevin hadn't tied his life to an unsuitable woman. Don't think poorly of me, Cassie. I blame myself for feeling this sense of relief. My son never spoke to me about Kristen again, and I thought I would never hear her name again. When he married you, I was overjoyed. I immediately liked you, polite, modest, hard-working, without the burden of a child. I thought that that chapter with Kristen was already in the past, and now you bring her up. So I rushed to unburden myself, of course. It's a long time ago, but I finally revealed the truth, that Kristen refused to marry my son, not of her own free will, and somehow this confession makes me feel better. The story of her husband's tragic first love deeply moved Cassie. She understood that despite her mother's disapproval, Kevin still cared for the woman who had rejected him. It's quite possible that Kristen never confessed to him that she refused to marry him solely due to the persuasive pleas of her beloved fiancé's mother. Out of some sense of nobility, which was unexpected coming from someone who grew up in a disadvantaged environment, Kristen didn't burden Kevin with herself. It seems that Kristen wasn't after wealth, but was truly a woman in love. Selma seemed to lose her appetite after the heavy confession. She sipped from her cup of cold tea, entirely ignoring the treats on the table. Cassie, unsure of how to respond, remained silent and lost in thought, so Selma's next words caught the woman off guard. Cassie, why did you ask about Kristen in the first place? Has she ever contacted you, or made herself known in some other way? For some reason, Cassie didn't dare to tell the truth. It felt as if Kevin kept this secret so she had no right to reveal it. It was something I read on a piece of paper, and it piqued my curiosity. Curiosity isn't a vice, after all, as they say, but rather a great virtue. I apologise, Selma, for unintentionally upsetting you. Please forgive me. I think I'll go home. I have a headache. Selma actually seemed relieved that her daughter-in-law was leaving. 
and didn't attempt to persuade her to stay a little longer. On the way home, Cassie tried to cope with her emotions and not get irritated. First and foremost, she felt offended. Was her husband so distrustful of her that he couldn't share this aspect of his life? His generosity towards the unfortunate woman he had planned to marry, but couldn't due to tragic circumstances, only reflected positively on him. Did he know her so poorly that he feared her jealousy towards Kristen or her indignation at the funds sent to the boarding house? Cassie had once believed that she was doing everything right by giving Kevin personal space, but it turned out that the man had built a wall between them in the form of a carefully guarded secret. However, she couldn't ask him now why he believed that his unlawful wife didn't need to know about the support provided to his former bride. Cassie returned home with a firm intention to visit the boarding house in the near future. It was necessary not only to figure out how to continue paying for the charity services, but also to inform Kristen about Kevin's death. After all, they had once had feelings for each other. Surely the sad news would cause her unpleasant emotions, but it wouldn't be humane or fair to leave the unhappy woman in the dark. In memory of her husband, Cassie decided not to abandon his fiance, but her financial situation suggested that it would not be easy. In general, the thought of visiting the boarding house filled Cassie with a certain fear and sometimes outright panic. She feared both the potential bureaucratic obstacles and Kristen's negative reaction, as well as the upcoming negotiations with the management of the institution regarding instalment payments, because paying the entire year at once was almost impossible. However, Cassie gathered her courage, learned the visiting hours in advance and scheduled an appointment with the director of the institution before embarking on her journey. The boarding house, Mercy, whose pictures Cassie had carefully studied on the internet, made a pleasant impression in reality. The tall pine trees surrounding the small, cosy buildings gave a sense of security. The air was fresh with a subtle aroma of resin, evoking thoughts of something sublime, pure and eternal. Cassie took a deep breath and proceeded to meet the director. There was no one in the reception room. After knocking on the door and hearing the invitation to enter, Cassie looked into the small office. A young woman, sitting in front of a computer monitor, asked, "'Hello, what brings you here?' There was no picture of the director on the website, and Cassie thought that the person in front of her was an assistant or a secretary. Not envisaging the director of the institution like this woman, Cassie mentioned that she needed to talk to Mrs. Thornhill about Kristen Richards, who was staying in the boarding house. The woman, who turned out to be the director after all, nodded affably. "'Oh, it's me. Sit down, please.' I was informed that you planned to come today. Trying to speak as calmly as possible, Cassie explained that her late husband used to cover the expenses for a patient named Kristen Richards and shared her financial difficulties. Mrs. Thornhill, from what I have seen, the facility you manage indeed provides the most comfortable conditions and I understand the need to pay for it all. However, I am unable to pay for an entire year at once. Could you possibly accept monthly payments? This confession didn't shock the director of the boarding house at all. She smiled. In general, if you pay for a year, we offer a discount, and the cost of staying becomes slightly less than paying month by month. However, I believe we can find a solution and continue adjusting the amount for monthly payments. Besides, to be honest, Kristen Richards doesn't require extensive care from my staff. She is quite capable of taking care of herself. She's a wonderful woman with a strong character. By the way, if you would like, you can meet her. Would you be interested? Cassie nodded. The sum was still quite significant for her budget. She would need to think of something for the future, maybe even look for a less expensive facility, but for now, she decided to leave things as they were. After the new contract was formalised, Mrs Thornhill personally escorted Cassie to a large hall known as the Game Room, according to the director. In the spacious and well-lit room, the residents of the boarding house were engaged in various activities. Some were playing chess and checkers. A small group gathered around a table, filling out bingo cards. A few people, including a relatively young man, were knitting near the windows, which had been cleaned to a shine. Mrs Thornhill led the visitor to one of the needlewomen, who was sitting in a wheelchair. The former, Kevin's bride, looked far different from the way Cassie had imagined her, according to her mother-in-law's story. Kristen's brown hair was cut short, and she had no makeup on. Her huge eyes seemed to dominate her face. 
there was a noticeable burn mark on her left cheek, but it was not repulsive. Overall, Kristen appeared to Cassie as quite a pretty woman. Having put her knitting aside, she looked at the director and the guest and greeted them. Mrs. Thornhill introduced the two women to each other and suggested, "'If you wish, you can talk here, or in the garden, or in your bedroom. Which option is more convenient?' Kristen put away her knitting in a box on the window sill and said, "'Mrs. Thornhill, it would probably be better outside.' Cassie followed Kristen, who skillfully manoeuvred the wheelchair, and as they walked, she wondered if she had started all this for nothing. Talking to the woman Kevin had once loved promised to be rather difficult. The women reached a bench located far away from the central alley, and in a somewhat hostess-like manner, Kristen invited Cassie to sit down and asked, "'So, judging by your last name, I assume you're Kevin's wife?' Cassie nodded. She tried to find the words to tell Kristen about the death of the man they both loved, but her companion spared her the heavy task by simply saying bitterly, "'I knew that something irreparable had happened to Kevin. Despite having to let him go, he always behaved like a real man. He brought me to this wonderful place where it's peaceful and cosy. I feel so sorry for Kevin. It's just unbelievable. He came to me in a dream about a month and a half ago as if to say goodbye. He promised that he would watch over my Stacy. I immediately realized then that he had left the world of the living. I know from experience that words of condolence offer little consolation, but believe me, I fully share your pain. Kevin was the best person I have ever met. I always wished him nothing but happiness, even if I couldn't give it to him. I'm incredibly sorry that such a bright man has left this world forever. I will mourn Kevin forever. Cassie looked at the woman sitting across from her in the wheelchair, amazed by her sincerity. Kristen's sympathy was genuine without any pretense. Only this woman, who had gone through a terrible ordeal, truly understood her. Cassie involuntarily thought that if it hadn't been for Selma's interference, Kevin and Kristen could have lived happily together. These thoughts made her throat tighten. Cassie realized that she was about to cry, so she fidgeted and hurriedly said goodbye. Kristen, have you understood everything correctly? Kevin is truly no longer with us. It was an accident, a tragedy, and it seems that no one is to blame, but that doesn't make it any easier. I just wanted you to know. Now, let me help you back to the building. Kristen declined and Cassie hurried out of the boarding house. Only in the taxi she took a breath. As she watched other cars whizzing by, traffic lights, houses, trees and people, she thought about how to help Kristen. Thinking about this unfortunate person who had gone through much more hardship than herself, Cassie at least found a small distraction from her own grief. After leaving the boarding house, she decided to stop by her mother's and share the latest news. After all, Trudy still didn't know about the discovery Cassie made in her late husband's hiding place, and she didn't know about the trip. Upon hearing her daughter's story, Trudy raised her eyebrows in surprise. I could never have imagined that Kevin was capable of such a surprise, although, overall, he did a decent thing. He didn't leave poor Kristen in the lurch, he didn't burden you with information about his past relationships. He didn't upset his mother, knowing that she wouldn't approve of helping her ex fiance whom she considered unworthy of her son, especially after the accident. Selma probably shouldn't have interfered in Kevin's personal life, but what's done is done, and it's pointless to speculate about what might have been if Kristen had become her daughter-in-law. Realising that her daughter was shocked by the situation, Trudy interrupted her speech and resorted to a proven method of dealing with stress. She fed Cassie home-cooked food. Grace, who had returned home, finally diffused the situation. The cheerful girl distracted her older stepsister and mother from unhappy thoughts by telling funny stories. Leaving her mother's apartment, Cassie went out in a much more balanced mood. The support of loved ones had truly benefited her. Back at home, Cassie went up to the attic and sat on a comfortable chair, which seemed to hold the shape of her husband's body. Looking at the details of the unfinished layout, she pondered her next steps. What am I going to do now? I don't have enough resources to permanently pay for Kristen's boarding house, and it wouldn't be right to leave her without help. Or maybe I should. I just accept that she means nothing to me and forget about her. Cassie had no answers to these questions. She didn't see herself as a villain or a saint. 
but she couldn't shake off thoughts about Kristen. There was something very touching about this woman with big eyes. Perhaps, in memory of her husband, who cared for his former bride, Cassie felt obligated to continue his kindness. On the other hand, not every woman would be able to show such generosity, especially considering the financial burden it placed on her own comfort. It was clear that Cassie wouldn't be able to afford Kirsten's stay in a private boarding house for long, and a cheaper institution might not be as pleasant. She needed to come up with a plan and not delay it. For now, Cassie decided to at least continue visiting Kristen regularly, and she didn't realise how it happened, but at some point these visits became a habit, occurring at least twice a month. Surprisingly, she and Kristen became friends. Apart from their shared memories of Kevin, they didn't have much in common, and talking about him only opened their barely healed wounds. However, their communication became more and more pleasant and trusting. During the new year and Christmas holidays, Cassie went to the boarding home with her stepfather because it was difficult to transport several heavy bags of gifts without a personal car. Cassie's stepfather didn't mind going out of town, and Trudy, who noticed that visits to the boarding house helped Cassie cope with her longing for Kevin, was glad to take part in this trip. However, most of the time the young widow visited Kristen and the other residents she had gotten to know alone, conversations with people who were in comfortable conditions but limited in their freedom of movement became a true salvation for Cassie. The unexpected insights from the boarding house residents helped her see different aspects of life in a new light. Once, Kristen said to Cassie, Can you imagine? There isn't a day that goes by when I don't remember my daughter and wonder what would have happened if I had listened to Kevin and postponed the trip to my mother's. However, more and more, I feel like this misfortune happened to me for a reason, for some kind of personal growth. It might sound strange coming from a woman confined to a wheelchair, but it's here within the walls of this boarding house that I've started to grow as a person. Here, I've started educating myself. I've been reading books, not just for fun, but thoughtfully. I've also learned needlework. It didn't come easily at first, but then I found a kind of extravagant courage. Isn't it amazing and delightful when a real item emerges from yarn and simple tools? Following Kristen's recommendation, Cassie tried her hand at needlework. The new experience was interesting, and the conversations with Kristen and other residents, who maintained their spirits despite facing terrible problems, helped Cassie view her own pain with a different, more detached perspective. Despite the wonderful conditions at the boarding house, being virtually locked up was still quite challenging. Cassie had her freedom, while the other residents of the institution had to follow its rules. In one spring weekend, Cassie was shopping. There were more visitors than usual, and everyone was in high spirits. However, Cassie's heart felt uneasy, because bonuses were unexpectedly cut at work, and unfortunately, there was no sign of the situation improving, and the prospect of a small salary did not bring any joy. Cassie realised that under the circumstances, she wouldn't be able to afford the boarding house services. She thought about inviting Kristen to her house, which was originally built for a happy family life with Kevin, but making such a radical change wasn't easy. It would require making modifications to the house to accommodate someone in a wheelchair, and the thought of transitioning from short meetings to permanent cohabitation was daunting. But the fate had her own plan. One evening, after visiting Kristen, Cassie headed towards the bus stop to go to the city. As she walked, a car pulled up next to her. The man in the driver's seat looked familiar to her. She often saw him at the boarding house, and they would greet each other, even though they hadn't been formally introduced. Cassie knew that he was visiting an elderly woman, and assumed he wanted to discuss something. However, instead of that, the man suggested, "'If you're going to town, get in. It looks like the snow clouds are gathering, even though the first week of spring has already passed.' Feeling tired and realising that the man didn't seem like a villain at all, and was actually somewhat familiar, Cassie thanked him and agreed. A little while later, as she settled into the car, she realised that the man, who introduced himself as Harry, just wanted someone to talk to. "'You know, I placed my great-aunt in a nursing home,' he said guiltily. "'To be honest, I'm ashamed. She raised me, you could say, and I put her in a penitentiary.' 
I could have easily arranged for a nurse to take care of her and provide medical treatment, which would have been no problem. After all, I work at a reputable private clinic and have connections with medical professionals. However, as it became increasingly difficult for my aunt to move around, she requested to be placed in a facility where she could receive care and companionship. That's the only way I can justify my decision, because I really haven't a lot of spare time on my hands. The man paused for a moment and then asked, Forgive me for being indelicate, but do you have a sister there? I've seen you in the company of a young woman. Cassie involuntarily smiled. She and Kristen did bear a subtle resemblance. Apparently, Kevin had a preference for a certain type of woman and had a penchant for consistency. However, Cassie didn't want to delve into a lengthy explanation, so she simply reassured her new acquaintance. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say that I have a good friend staying at the boarding house. However, Harry, you needn't worry. Thanks to Mrs. Thornhill and the charitable team, the conditions there are nearly ideal. Of course, it would be ridiculous to envy people who have lost their health, but in my opinion, this boarding house is wonderful. The air is healing, the buildings are clean, and there is plenty of social interaction to keep one from getting bored. In general, don't worry, Harry. I believe it's better for your aunt to be among people rather than suffering alone, waiting for a hired help or your return from work. Harry scrutinised his companion attentively. She spoke with such confidence that there was no room for doubt. It was a well-considered stance. Cassie continued to share what was on her mind. The boarding house is a fantastic place. The only drawback is that it's a bit expensive. But they don't take money from relatives for nothing. Everything is fair. Besides, no matter how much I inquire, the residents are delighted with the Mercy team. It's lovely to see people with compassionate hearts working there, as it holds special significance. The man reluctantly agreed, as he had heard nothing but positive reviews about the staff and the institution from his aunt as well. The companions did not notice that the time had passed on the way to the city. Harry inquired, Where do you live? I have free time today and can give you a ride. Cassie hesitated and confessed that she needed to go to the bus station to reach her suburb house. Harry firmly responded, Well, if you allow me, I'll take you there. It's a short ride and we can have a heartfelt conversation. It's been a while since I've had one. There was no traffic on the road, and soon Cassie was waving goodbye because Harry declined the polite offer of tea or coffee. Sorry, but I have to leave. Maybe another time. Thank you for your words. Your opinion was important to me, and you have reassured me. Maybe now I won't feel guilty. Although Cassie couldn't even think about starting a new romance after her husband's death, life continued and pushed her to interact with people, including men. Harry appreciated Cassie's reasonableness, intelligence, and her remarkable ability to empathise. Cassie had no intention of starting a new love story, but she enjoyed the gallantry of their casual acquaintance. They saw each other several times at the boarding house, exchanged greetings and had polite conversations. Occasionally, Harry would drive her to the bus station, to her mother's apartment, or directly to her house. Her new acquaintance was reserved, but Kristen soon noticed his fondness for Cassie and said during a conversation, Please, don't get angry. I'll be up front with you. It seems like this Harry, who visits Mrs. Benderwald, has taken a liking to you. If you ask me, he seems like a reliable man, and you shouldn't miss the chance for happiness. At least, don't treat him with such a distant look. Smile at him. Let him know you're interested. I understand that you loved Kevin, and you still do. That feeling doesn't disappear, and death has no power over it. I was crazy about Kevin myself, but life goes on. What's the point of denying yourself happiness? Cassie usually diverted such conversations to neutral topics. However, it wasn't just Kristen who told her that life must go on. Her mother also increasingly persuaded her not to dwell in grief. Even Selma, when her daughter-in-law visited, occasionally broached the uncomfortable topic with Cassie. I'm glad you remember my son, but he would be distressed to see you suffering so much. I understand that this longing cannot be helped. My husband, Kevin's dad, died tragically when our son was barely ten years old. I haven't even looked at another man since. You know, Cassie, based on my experience, you can't bury yourself after your husband's death. It's not right. 
Well, at least I had a son. Among other worries, I was afraid of choosing the wrong stepfather for Kevin. But you're all alone, Cassie. It's not right. However, arranging her personal life was the least of Cassie's concerns. The lack of money loomed over her. The work atmosphere grew increasingly tense, and the once regular bonuses became a thing of the past. Rumours of layoffs circulated among her colleagues. The once friendly team turned into a den of spiders, as the boss suddenly encouraged employees to report on each other. Two women worked in the department alongside Kathy, and she watched in genuine amazement as they meticulously recorded late arrivals and early departures. There would be an indignant exclamation, followed by a muffled grunt and hurried typing on the computer keyboard. They're reporting disciplinary breaches to their superiors in the chat room, Cassie guessed. However, she had refrained from condemning her colleagues. After all, snitching would be on their conscience. She had no intention of participating in this unfair game, initiated by her superiors. However, if she were suddenly laid off, financing Kristen's stay at the boarding house would become very difficult. Cassie didn't have many choices. She couldn't stop helping Kristen, as it would feel like a betrayal. So she had to find a way to navigate the situation with minimal loss to her quality of life. She had two options regarding Kristen. The first option was to invite her to her house, which would require some small changes in the house to accommodate her wheelchair. The second option was to sell the house, where everything reminds her of Kevin, and look for a more modest apartment, with the rest of the proceeds she could pay for a boarding house. However, the second option seemed unfavourable to Cassie. Even if she put the difference in the bank and earned interest, this reserve would eventually run out. Then what? Go back to worse housing conditions. The idea of resettling in the city was also unsettling for Cassie. She had grown accustomed to being able to harvest her own food from the plant garden or apple trees planted by the previous owners. It seemed more appropriate to invite Kristen to live with her. This would give her the opportunity to breathe fresh air, even if not with the aroma of pine trees like at the boarding house. She would also have the benefit of natural products. Although there would be less socialising, the walls would not be a constant reminder of past grief. Worried, Cassie shared her idea with Kristen at their next meeting, eagerly awaiting her response. However, Kristen simply shrugged her shoulders and said, You know, I realise that the boarding house is not a cheap option, and I sometimes thought about returning to my late mother's home, but that would be an extremely undesirable option for me. I'm content here, of course, but I increasingly feel the desire to go beyond this quiet existence. So, if you think I would be comfortable living with you, I would be happy to move in, even if only temporarily. It would be like a vacation for me, and if that doesn't work out, I'm ready to look for a job that provides housing. Surely something can be found. Cassie was glad that Kristen liked her idea. Although the move would not be a simple process, they reached an agreement in principle. The family supported Cassie's initiative, however her mother-in-law unexpectedly opposed the idea of the failed wife of her deceased son soon living in their house. Cassie, you are a kind soul, and I don't blame you for this. It's actually a good thing that there are still people like you in the world, but why take on this burden? Kristen is a grown woman who has experienced a terrible tragedy. It's clear that she hasn't been able to forget the nightmare she went through, and she likely has not only physical challenges, but also psychological ones. At least she is being professionally cared for at the boarding house, and there is medical assistance. Have you thought about how you will provide for all this? It's a suburb not far from the city, but it still takes time to get to the hospital. Selma continued to give various arguments, but seeing that none of them were affecting Cassie, she finally blurted out, Please understand that if Kirsten moves in with you, I can no longer come to this house. I still feel embarrassed when I think about our last meeting, when she agreed to sacrifice her happiness and break off her engagement with Kevin. I know for a fact that he has no idea I was the reason for her decision. It might sound silly, but I feel ashamed. After my son's death, I reflected a lot on the past. Maybe Kevin was taken away from me because during the darkest period for Kristen, I not only didn't offer her a helping hand, but actually pushed her away. 
To Cassie's surprise, Selma became so nervous that she started to cry. After calming her mother-in-law with difficulty, Cassie carefully chose her words to avoid causing another outburst of tears and began to explain. You see, Kristen is no longer the woman you once knew. She has gone through a terrible ordeal, but has found the strength to grow and improve. Kristen is a talented craftswoman, and it's very interesting to interact with her. You know, if I were in her shoes, I would probably consider the whole world hostile and hold a grudge against you and her mother for the misfortune. That's just my nature. But she, despite losing all hope for happiness and finding herself in an institution, doesn't curse her fate. Instead, she lives and tries to benefit those around her as much as she can. Selma, trust me, you and Kristen just need to get to know each other again. I believe that once you spend time with her and get to know her, you will realize that she is a person deserving of respect. Selma carefully listened to Cassie's objections and realized that she wouldn't be able to change her daughter-in-law's mind. She had no choice but to accept it. After all, no one could force her to communicate with Kristen if she didn't want to. So, what was the point of dissuading her daughter-in-law from doing something good, even if it was burdensome? Mrs. Thornhill, the director of the boarding house, was not happy about Kristen leaving. Speaking to Cassie, she admitted, I'm very sorry that I have to prepare for the farewell. It's not just about the money you paid. We have plenty of people who want to stay with us. I'm genuinely sad to say goodbye to Kristen. However, if we're being honest, home conditions are often better than professional care. Moreover, judging from the photos you shared, Kristen will be comfortable at your place. I'll provide you with a memo containing contacts of doctors, pharmacies, stores where you can buy care products, and my personal phone number. You are welcome to call me any time. I'll always be willing to help. Cassie was grateful to Mrs. Thornhill for sharing such important information about trusted contacts without any prompting. Kristen maintained a positive attitude and believed that the move would go well. She felt that a new chapter in her life was beginning and she hoped it would be calm and joyful, given her circumstances. After learning about Kristen's move from her aunt, Harry immediately offered his help to Cassie. He said, I can arrange transportation for your friend in a suitable car. If you need any men's work done for the repairing, I have some contacts. They can install a ramp quickly and conscientiously, and their services are reasonably priced. Cassie accepted Harry's offer of support. Upon closer inspection of the house, they discovered new obstacles that could hinder Kristen's mobility. They needed to remove thresholds, rearrange furniture, and take care of many important details. The tasks seemed overwhelming at times, and panic would set in. Surprisingly, when Cassie felt like everything was going wrong, and she was unprepared to receive Kristen, as if by magic, the obstacles started to disappear. With the help of family, Harry and others, the move eventually took place. Even Selma made a brief visit, despite feeling improper. However, Kristen spoke to her without any resentment. Everything went almost perfectly. The house, which had become a sanctuary for the women Kevin had loved, started a new chapter filled with lively activity. For the first time since Kevin's funeral, the house was filled with laughter and jokes. Trudy noticed that her daughter looked much better while observing her. Cassie regained her active and energetic nature, just as she had been before her husband's death. The sad anniversary was approaching, and Trudy was relieved that Cassie wouldn't be alone in the house during that time. With Kristen's presence, it would be easier for them to discuss the upcoming day and organize it. Cassie wasn't bothered by having Kristen in the house. She made sure to make Kristen feel comfortable as a tribute to Kevin. Carefully bringing down a few finished models from the attic, Cassie proudly showed them to Kristen. Kristen was surprised and whistled in amazement. She confessed, Kevin once told me that he dreamed of building all kinds of ships, but I had no idea he could create such works of art. He was so talented. You know, I'm glad that during his marriage with you, Kevin was able to pursue a hobby. The days flew by, and now it was the anniversary of Kevin's death. It was decided to go after the cemetery to go to a cafe. Although Kristen suggested staying at home, Cassie asked, Please, let's go. Since Kevin took care of you after the separation, 
it means that you are dear and important to him. Harry volunteered to solve the transportation issue for Kristen and her wheelchair. He periodically called Cassie and sent greetings from his aunt to Kristen. Despite his help, he didn't show any obvious romantic interest. It remained only to wonder whether his help was just sincere altruism. However, Cassie had more important concerns than understanding the motives of the man. She had been laid off from work and was unemployed. Although she received the owed amounts, she couldn't relax. She had to search for job vacancies online, send out resumes and attend interviews. Cassie hadn't found a suitable option yet, but she didn't despair or settle for obviously unsuccessful vacancies. She believed that things couldn't be bad all the time. Besides, she had a roof over her head, supplies in the cellar, and the vegetable garden was starting to yield results. With her ability to save money, she could manage for a few months without much worry. While driving the women home after the wake, Harry unintentionally mentioned that his firm needed a dispatcher and asked, "'Can't you recommend anyone? Maybe there is someone reliable. The salary, though, is not huge.' Cassie and Kristen exchanged silent glances. The amount mentioned by Harry was quite decent, but their silence gave him a peculiar impression. He quickly added, "'I understand it's not a very high salary, but it's realistic to work from home if the internet connection is stable. Please ask around among acquaintances if you can. It's a fixed scheduled job. If someone is interested, give them my phone number and I'll provide all the details. Cassie decided to respond immediately. Harry, there is no need to ask. I'll take this job starting from tomorrow. Kristen didn't support her friend. Listen, Cassie, I think it would be better if I could be of some use. This vacancy is perfect for me. You should take some rest until you find a stable job. Harry, who noticed that these two strong-willed women rarely complained about their lives to him, was surprised. Usually, when his acquaintances faced difficulties, they sought his help. But Cassie and Kristen had different principles, which he had noticed long ago. He found their attitude to him impressive and respected them, especially because it wasn't based on his financial capabilities. They didn't beg for his resources and were shyly accepting help. This approach was new to him. This time he didn't refuse the invitation for tea. During the tea, he explained the duties of a dispatcher to Kristen, and he also inquired in detail about Cassie's education and work experience. I'll ask around. Perhaps someone I know will have a suitable option. Good positions aren't typically given to strangers off the street, as they say. The women thanked Harry profusely, and when he left, Kristen started reproaching her friend. "'Why are you still ignoring him? It's time to move on from morning. Look, if you miss such a man, fate may not take pity on you.' Feeling upset by the visit to the cemetery, Cassie snorted resentfully. "'Listen, Kristen, I don't let anyone pry into my private life, and neither should you. If you're interested in Harry, go ahead and charm him. I'll pass. I'm still grieving for Kevin.' Kristen quietly apologised and went to her room. She was indeed embarrassed by crossing the line. Deep down, she felt a strong sympathy for Harry herself. Probably the reason for this feeling was the good advertisement that the loving auntie had made to the man. Wordy Mrs. Bennywold didn't hesitate to describe her nephew in the most wonderful and caring terms, showering him with superlative epithets. Harry was truly a dream come true, but how could she confined to a wheelchair, capture his attention. At least she could thank him for the help he provided with work. Although Kristen received a state allowance, she wanted to contribute a more substantial amount. Gradually, Harry started visiting the house more frequently, always welcome in their home. However, Cassie tried to keep her distance, not wanting to give the man false hopes. On the other hand, Kristen, with Cassie's full approval, made an effort to communicate with her boss as much as possible. The charming woman's beauty was not diminished by the scar from the burn, and Harry found himself increasingly drawn to Kristen. Compared to the cold and emotionless Cassie, who resembled the Snow Queen, Kristen was a vibrant volcano. Sometimes the man even forgot about her injuries, and the one day he made it his goal to find the best specialists to help her. He believed that with the right doctor, Kristen would return to a normal life again. Observing the love between them, Cassie was happy. 
She wanted her friend to have a companion. It all worked out harmoniously, because both Harry and Kristen were dear to her as close individuals. Cassie was not at all surprised when Kristen, embarrassed and blushing, told her, Cassie, I'm scared. Harry proposed to marry him. Can you imagine? He also arranged for a renowned medical expert to examine me and, if possible, help me walk again. Harry said that he's satisfied with everything and he doesn't want me to be sad about my limitations. You know, I feel so uncomfortable, as if I took Harry away from you and I don't know how to express my gratitude for your generosity. Cassie squatted down and took Kristen's hands in her palm. I am pleased for both you and Harry. Don't worry, you haven't fought anyone off. Be happy with Harry. Cassie had no regrets about pushing Kristen into Harry's safe hands. She liked the man, but only as a good and kind person, not as a potential life partner. She still missed her husband and hoped that she had fulfilled her obligations to the unhappy but not broken woman. At the wedding of her friend and Harry, Cassie sincerely celebrated for the newlyweds. Even though the bride was still in a wheelchair, she whispered in Cassie's ear, One of the doctors gives a rather optimistic prognosis for treatment. Thanks to Harry's support, Cassie found a job with a decent salary. A few years later, when the pain from her husband's premature death became less intense and burning, the woman reciprocated the advances of a colleague. Everyone liked Jason. She, the relatives, and Kristen, having met him, began to insist. Cassie, you more than anyone else deserves happiness. Honestly, Kevin would say the same if he could. I can only call you a saint. You didn't abandon me. You paid for my boarding house, gave me a place to stay, and found me a husband. Kindness should be rewarded. Marry Jason and be happy. Cassie listened to her friend's advice and moved into her husband's house after the wedding. The woman did not sell the house in the village, turning it into a summer cottage, and she always went up to the attic with special trepidation, where many years ago she found a hidden contract, which began a chain of unexpected discoveries.